Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Well, the murder trial of Derek Chauvin, the white police officer charged in the murder of George Floyd, began this week. Chauvin was seen in a viral video kneeling on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes, causing his death. Floyd's demise led to a series of police brutality protests by tens of thousands of people around the world. Here to speak on the impact this trial will have on the police force's treatment of the black minority is U.S. attorney with experience as a defense counsel in both state and U.S. federal courts, Asuko Mendie Archibong. Asuko, welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this trial centers on three charges, murder in the second degree, murder in the third degree and second degree manslaughter. When we look at this from a legal uh, point of view, is the, are these charges there to increase the possibility of conviction come verdict? Uh, yes. Let, let's just step back and look at what the charges really are. Now, the, he, the Richardson was not charged with first degree murder. We could have required proving intent to kill George Floyd. Uh, it's almost impossible to uh, show intent beyond a reasonable doubt to kill um, a, a person by a police officer. So they went for the lesser charges of second degree murder, uh, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. Now, so that people can really just follow along, let's see what the second degree murder here. Understand that the laws are different in the different states of the United States. In Minnesota, it's different. Second degree murder just speaks to the prosecutors have to show, to prove beyond reasonable doubt, that Derek Chauvin assaulted um, uh, George Floyd and caused his loss of life. And that should be while assaulting him. So just two things have to, to, to be proven beyond reasonable doubt, the assault and a loss of life. They don't have to show any intention to kill. Now, the third degree murder generally the, the prosecutors have to also prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, mark that standard beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin perpetrated an act. That would be the first element that they have to show that was eminently dangerous to others. That would be the second element. And then the third one, um, uh, evincing a depraved mind. That would be the third element. And the last one would be without regard to human life. So they have to beyond reasonable doubt that the Shovel uh, perpetrated an act eminently dangerous to others with a depraved mind and without regard to human life. Now, when you come down to manslaughter, they brought it down to second degree manslaughter. They just have to show beyond reasonable doubt, culpable negligence on the part of the Shovel and unreasonable uh, act on the part of the Derek Shovel as well. All the defense have to do is to sow the element of doubt. That means if any of the jurors says, hmm, uh, I don't believe A, B, or C, then there is no conviction. So let's also now look at what, when I say jurors, let's look at what the, the, the jury system really is in one sentence. Just 12 persons similarly placed in the community as the defendant who will now come to take a vote as to the guilt or non-guilt of the defendant. And for there to be a conviction, every single juror, every single one of the 12 have to, uh, have to vote for the conviction on each of the charges. There may be three charges. If one person on any charge says, I don't have a reasonable doubt and I vote no, then there is no conviction. Thank that, you. I actually wanted to come here. To I wanted to come in on that. Uh, you know, you made the point very rightly that judges and uh, jurors, rather, their decision must be unanimous. Everybody has to agree uh, for a, a guilty verdict to be able to be put through. But when we look at the specifics of this case, it involves police. It involves race in America. When you add all of those mixings into this situation, how likely do you think a conviction is going to be, even with video evidence? It, it, it's, it's always an uphill task to convict a member of the police force in the United States. 
You, you remember in 1984, the, 83, 84, the Rodney King riots in, in Los Angeles. I mean, we had video evidence. That was the first time there was video evidence of the beating of a black man. Yet, we were unable to get a conviction with, with the killing of black people, black men most especially. It's always difficult to get a conviction. If that killing is at the hands of another race, even more difficult to get a conviction if it is at the hands of the police. Remember Trevor uh, Martin. Um, uh, in the history of the state of so that, and also in Minneapolis Police Department, we've only had one conviction of a police officer, and that was on third degree murder. And uh, let's look at that, at that, why that police officer was convicted. He was originally from Ethiopia. He had just moved to the United States, applied to the Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis Police uh, Department, and in the course of carrying out his duty, he shot a woman, and it happened to be a white woman. And for the first time, his name was Muhammad Noor, for the first time, a police officer was convicted for the killing of a person in, in an MPD. Now, we come to, to uh, the instant case of George Moore. You have to show beyond a reasonable doubt, and even when you've shown beyond a reasonable doubt that all of these things occurred, the police officer has certain protections that members of the public do not have. What are these protections? One, you now have to go again and show that his actions were unreasonable when placed beside the actions of a reasonable police officer. Okay. All right. That so is the last step. Mm. So we've seen emotions in the first few days of this trial beginning. We're now beginning to see powerful testimonies. Yesterday, we saw the longest serving police officer in Minneapolis testify that the force used by Derek Chauvin was unnecessary and uncalled for. Um, and from the opening statements of the prosecution and the defense counsels, we have a fair idea of where they're both going. Uh, how easy would it be? I mean, the jurors are seeing this video and different angles, uh, body cams are now being shown, never before seen footage. Uh, they say a picture holds a thousand words, and this is a video playing a picture in the minds of these jurors. Uh, how easy would it be for the defense to punch holes in that? How, now, in other words, how well is the prosecution making their case so far? They are doing a fantastic job. Now, what they first did was uh, they, they stated in their opening statement, uh, the Attorney General of the State, uh, uh, Keith Ellis, um, um, said, we will show um, that George, uh, uh, George Floyd was killed at the hands of Derry Chauvin, and that Derry Chauvin's actions were unreasonable, and that led to the death of George Floyd. That, 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 doing a, a fantastic job. You'll notice that they are rotating. There are about four of them. One small tidbit is that two of the um, prosecutors are actually volunteers. They are doing a pro bono. Schlechter is actually a former U.S. attorney and very, very skilled at what he's doing. Um, you also notice that it appears to, there is only one defense counsel. That is just for the jury to see and make it appear as if it is uh, Goliath versus uh, um, David. He, Eric Nelson, who is the defense counsel, has 14 attorneys behind him sitting outside of the courtroom. Now, the challenge is not showing the video and evincing some level of intense emotions from people in the courtroom and outside of the court. The challenge and where the ambush is, as defense counsel in criminal cases, where the ambush is, is showing causation. Notice that the defense is doing a great job so far, and they've not presented their case. They are doing a great job in jabbing and keeping the prosecution at bay. Why do I say so? Their, 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 their argument is, no, Derek Chauvin didn't cause the death of George Floyd. He had drugs in his system, and those drugs caused his death. So ultimately, it's going to be a battle of the expert down the line. The defense wants to get away from this emotional questioning and state 
as quickly as possible. That's why they didn't question some of the witnesses. And some of their cross-examinations have been very minimal. They want to get away as quickly as possible. They want to get away from the process as quickly as possible. When you talked about the police, longest serving police officer, number one police officer and MPD, the, uh, 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 Lieutenant Zimmerman, he said it was on all Yes. But the defense is, when he presents his own case, he's going to say, hey, he had opioid in his system. He had heroin, heroin in his system. He has been a long-term user of drugs. He actually was admitted into the hospital for drug overdose. Those around him have been using drugs. He used drugs just a week before his encounter with the police that led to his death. Now, here is a case of excited delirium. He didn't die from the knee of uh, Derek Chauvin. He died because his system was already too weak to handle any form of stress. And he died because of the drugs that he had been using. He died because in the last two, three months, he used drugs, opioids purchased from the street, which is inherently more dangerous than those purchased from the people that have bought them, uh, that have had a prescription for them. So th that is where you're going to see the actual legal battle. Right now, the prosecution is winning the hearts and minds of the people. E even I became so, so sad, so uncomfortable seeing the knee on the neck and realizing, no, it was not eight minutes and 43 uh, 46 seconds. It was actually nine minutes and 29 seconds to have your knee on the neck but where the battle is going to come down to is going to be causation. The prosecution is fantastic. They've done a fantastic job. They have, to some extent, and, and really to a great extent, kind of push aside the sting of the drug used by um, uh, George Floyd when they presented the evidence from his uh, girlfriend. And she testified as to their drug use. And, and, and therefore... Even if the jury gets to hear, members of the jury gets to hear again the presentation of the drug use um, by the defense, the prosecution has already controlled the initial narrative. And when, when you're talking about the drug use, it, it was opioid. Now, opioid is more used by the Caucasian, by the white people in the United States. And you're going to have greater sense of sympathy for George Floyd in that instance. If you're talking of marijuana, heroin, and uh, some other uh, drugs mainly used by black people, you'll find out that the legal system has a disparity in the sentencing guidelines for <laughs> different types of drugs, believe it or not. And you're going to have members of the jury, maybe some persons within that jury might actually say, yes, my cousin has had to use this. My sister has had to use this. And look at the position for the drug use of uh, George Floyd as well testified to by his girlfriend. Understood. The Obviously, we can't of... preempt or predict what the verdict will be. Yeah. But using that example that you just used, oh, we are oh, sadly... Sadly, we, Asukwa, we have run out of time. Asukwa Achibong is an attorney who's just been able to talk to us about the impact of the Derek Chauvin trial accused of the murder of George Floyd. Thank you very much for joining us. It is